Hi folks and welcome back. This is Unit 3, Lecture 2 on Substance Dualism for Intro to Philosophy. Today we're going to be looking at the aptly titled selection, Substance Dualism, originally written by René Descartes as part of our selection on metaphysics, where we're looking at the question of what sort of a thing is a human being. So, we're going to do the usual sort of stuff in this lecture. We're going to do the big picture overview. We're going to look at the arguments from the reading in, partic in particular detail and then end with our usual food for thought and potential issues. I always include these overviews just so that in case anything does change, you will be entirely aware of it. So I'm not just wasting your time by including these slides, I promise. So let's go ahead and get to the meat of it all, shall we? So our author this go around is a fellow by the name of René Descartes. I mean, it's a French name, so it's not Descartes, it's Descartes. And if you mispronounce his name, I swear, like Liam Neeson and Taken, I will find you, and I will correct you. I will really force you to stop saying Descartes, I swear. Too many people make that mistake. Anyway, Descartes, Descartes was a French modern philosopher and mathematician. And I say modern because really anything in philosophy after the medieval period is kind of considered in the modern time period. So for us, it's kind of a relative term. When we talk about more living folks, we generally say contemporary or current philosophy. But anyway, Descartes really well known for his work in metaphysics, epistemology, and particularly the philosophy of mind. And I promise you've actually seen some of his work before. If you have ever graphed something in a math class on a coordinate plane, you know, something where you had to count over for the x's and up for the y's, well then you did work on what's known, in addition to a coordinate plane, as a Cartesian plane. Something that this guy, this particular Frenchman, came up with about 400 something years ago while he was sick in bed with a fever and staring at a fly on the ceiling and realizing that he could describe where it was by counting over and up from a particular fixed point on the ceiling. Honestly, when you kind of look at the things that people like this guy accomplished, it starts making you feel a little inadequate in life sometimes. But despite all of his fame among mathematicians and math teachers, my own mother included, He's actually best well known in philosophy for a work called Meditations on First Philosophy, or just more commonly, The Meditations. And this is where our reading comes from, actually. See, The Meditations are Descartes' attempts, sort of, like, not literally, not literally, but sort of, to try and start philosophy over from scratch, at least for himself. He wanted to throw out the kinds of things that happened in most other people's books. See, in the medieval period, the big... Motive, like the big fundamental movement was called scholasticism. And it was really characterized by large debates, references to other scholars, and subtle, complicated arguments. They didn't do so many big systematic things. They would usually refer to somebody like Aristotle and say, okay, so if Aristotle says this, then what should we conclude about this particular matter of theology or small metaphysical question? And so all the papers were sort of complicated. You had to know the context. You already had to know the debates. It was really hard to get a grasp on things, and there weren't really clear answers. Quite honestly, it was pretty similar to today's philosophy. But Descartes wanted to get away from all that. Instead, he wanted to try and work out a single big systematic set of beliefs and arguments for like pretty much everything. And so to start off with, that meant that he needed to find an absolute foundation for every belief that he had, and only believe those beliefs that he had justification for. If he couldn't justify it, then he wasn't going to still continue to think it, and continue to believe, believe it, and can consider it true. So instead, he was going to try and find something that was absolutely certain, something beyond all doubt, something that would serve as a foundation for everything else, and then derive all of the other true beliefs from that absolutely certain statement. So he was searching for justification, and then only tried to believe in what he thought he was justified in doing so. And we'll actually get to see a little bit of this in another unit of the course when we get to the epistemology section. But here's our focus for now. You see, in the process of doing all this, Descartes actually ends up doing some metaphysics in addition to worrying about beliefs and justification and the rest. You see, if you remember, last time we talked about metaphysical questions. You know, we looked at the ship of Theseus, some stuff about identity, some stuff about brains and jars and missile silos and radiation. 
But the big fo focus with all that, the point of all those imaginary sci-fi scenarios, was the question, what kind of a thing am I? And we briefly looked, like very briefly, looked at three possible answers to that question. You know, three kinds of answer that you could respond. You could say that we're totally physical, that is, that materialism is true, is the true explanation of what a human being is. You could say that we're purely non-physical, which is very rare and a little weird, but it's known as the label as idealism. Or you could say that we're both physical and non-physical beings, that we've got both physical and non-physical parts. And that's the view, the explanation, called dualism. And you see, it turns out that in the process of searching for his ultimate foundation for his beliefs, Descartes actually ends up, as part of his big system, arguing for and giving us a classic version of dualism that's often referred to as substance dualism. Now remember, our three big positions are kind of like the objectivism and relativism labels. They're kinds of answers. They're not specific answers in and of themselves. So Descartes' view is a version of dualism. In particular, it's a version of dualism that essentially argues that human beings are composed of two entirely different kinds of stuff, things that Heath calls substances. And so we're made up of both physical substance and mental substance. And the reason why he uses the term substance is actually kind of related to the original Latin term, substantia, which literally means that which stands beneath. So a substance, then, is the actual thing that's underneath all the other properties and appearances of a thing. So regardless of how you change and transform something, you know, whether you paint it, you grind it up, you liquefy it, you make it hot, cold, stinky, dirty, whatever else you do to it, then the substance is the thing that's underneath all those changes. It's the thing that's constant throughout it all. So a substance, per Descartes, is a thing which has properties, and there can be different kinds of substance. You know, again, there can be physical or mental substance. And it's worth trying to get this vocabulary down in more detail before we actually get to the arguments themselves. So I want to spend a couple more minutes on what I mean by these. So, again, Descartes argues that there are two kinds of substances. Physical substance, or more technically in his terminology, extended substance, in Latin, the res extensa, or thinking substance, the res cogitans. And this is the thinking and mental stuff. Now, extended substance is his label for physical things. And he calls them this because he thinks that the defining characteristic of a physical object is that it is extended in space. It is, it's got measurements. It's literally, you know, has measurements and magnitude in three different directions, you know, length, breadth, width, or length, width, and height, however you want to label the different dimensions. The point is that physical things are characterized by being extended across space. They have measurements, you can cut them up into pieces, you can point where it starts and where it stops. That's sort of the thing that makes a physical thing what it is, because only some physical substances are solid, only some are, so, you know, substantial in the more metaf metaphorical sense of the word. So for him, it's the fact that they're extended in space that makes them what they are. And another thing that all physical substance, all extended substance, has in common for Descartes is that it's non-conscious. For the most part, it's all inanimate stuff. You know, rocks, chairs, trees, pencils, frogs. Eh, frogs are debatable. But the point is, is that physical things are all extended stuff, and they're all, for the most part, non-conscious. They don't think. They're not aware of anything. You know, a rock doesn't feel anything when you kick it. Now, a thinking substance, on the other hand, is just what it says in the tin, or it's exactly what the name describes. You know, thinking substances are thinking things. Now, thinking things don't have physical measurements. It doesn't make any sense to say that your mind is big, or that this mind has you know, more length than another mind, or something like that. It doesn't make any sense. It's also kind of hard to say that there are parts to a mind, because it's really hard to divide it up and say that this is one thing and that's another, the way that you can with physical stuff. You know, a physically extended object, you can say, okay, this portion over here is doing something, and this piece over here is not. You, know, you can put a line between where the relevant part and where the non-relevant parts are. With mind, it's a little harder to do, because no matter what you're doing mentally, that is, you know, loving, thinking, having a desire, you know, any of those different things, 
it's kind of hard to say that there's a that there's something that's separate from you that's doing it. So in general, it's kind of hard to divide up mental things according to Descartes. So here he's really thinking about non-physical, non-brain things, more like mind or a self or a soul than any sort of brain or physical thing. Now technically in Descartes' view of the universe, there's also a third sort of substance called eternal substance or divine substance, but we're really not going to get into the details of that, so don't worry about it. So as far as you're concerned, Descartes thinks there are two kinds of substances. Extended substance, that is physical stuff, and thinking substance, which is mental stuff. So, if you've got those terms down, you know, if you need to, pause, go back over the stuff, um, shoot me any questions if you need to. But with the vocab in hand, let's go ahead and get to the details of the argument. Now, Descartes opens up the whole reading with the same type of investigation that we're doing. At least our selection, that's what we're doing. You know, yay for a wonderfully chosen textbook. But he's going to open up by trying to find out what kind of a thing he is. Now, at this point in the meditations, he's already done a lot of work. Remember I said his big projects to find the justification for all his beliefs and to come up with this big grand system that will let him you know, derive all the other true beliefs from it. So at this point, he's already worked out an awful lot. And so we have to keep those in mind as we move forward, that he's going to take these kinds of things for granted. Now, if you're not so certain that you should take it for granted, just hold on and we'll get back to some of these in the epistemology unit of the course. I promise. But at this point, Descartes in particular is going to suppose that the only thing he can be absolutely certain of is that he exists and that, you know, he knows what's going on in his own mind. And we'll see precisely why a little bit later. That he knows that he exists, he knows that he thinks and that he can reason, and he knows these facts for certain. And because of this, Descartes go ahead and states pretty early, there on 293, that he is a thinking thing, that Descartes is, that human beings are thinking things. You know, the quote they use is actually pretty decent. You know, then what, what them and a, ugh. but what then am I? A thing which thinks. What is a thing which thinks? Is a thing which doubts, understands, conceives, affirms, denies, wills, refuses, and also imagines and feels. So he's not just talking like we're cold calculating Vulcans uh, or anything like that. We are things that do mental stuff, including all the emotions and desires and things that normally go on inside our own heads. And this isn't meant to be just a random observation. You know, he's not just starting off with some random weird thing. You see, Descartes thinks that being a thinking thing is our one defining feature. For one, it's one of the only things we can know for certain about ourselves, because we don't have to go through any extra steps to prove it. As soon as you start thinking about how could I know that I'm a thinking thing, well, you've pretty much just already given yourself evidence. You're thinking in order to think that question. You know, in the process of doubting or wondering or investigating at all, you've proven pretty directly that you know you can think and that this is one of the big things about you. And it kind of helps show that this is an immediate thing, that you, you know, there's no middle step to help figure it out. Descartes actually goes through an example you know, usually referred to as the ball of wax. So you know, Descartes has us consider something that for him would have been you know, very common and directly in front of him and most other readers. A small piece of wax, say from a candle or, or uh, I think more directly from a hive immediately. And so he wants us to, you know, think about how easy it is to observe and identify the wax. You know, we can look at it, we can handle it, we can see that it's, you know, kind of yellowish white, it smells like honey, you know, it's cold, it's hard, it's firm, it's slightly malleable, but not really. And so it's really easy for us to observe and identify and label all of its characteristics. But all of those characteristics can change. All you've got to do is leave that little lump of wax by the fire, and it'll start warming up, it'll start melting, it'll turn into a puddle, it'll get soft, it'll get squishy, its color will change, the scent will go away. Pretty much every quality about that little ball of wax can change. But somehow you still want to say that it's the same ball of wax as before. You know, even if you left the room and came back and saw it melted, for whatever reason, you would say it's still the same piece of wax. So that's not something that your senses directly give you. That's something that your mind has to think through a little bit. 
but your mind is able to grasp it pretty quickly and you're pretty certain about what your mind's doing so really the only thing you've got direct access to you know stuff with no middle ground no difficult steps or reasoning are judgments of the mind and so these judgments of the mind should be help you know should help be evidence that you directly and certainly know that you are a thinking thing and these characteristics you know being thinking that is having thoughts and desires and feelings and making choices and all this other stuff that this is what makes you different from every excuse me everything else in the world we can be really sure that these activities happen and it seems like just necessarily that they have to have someone attached to them there can't just be thoughts and desires floating around there's got to be somebody doing all of the thinking and desiring and all the rest of it and they seem pretty directly to be connected with us you know we're not seeing somebody else's thoughts we're seeing ours so it seems to be because it's so close so intimate so direct for us that it's just really fundamental to us that we're thinking things it seems to be like it's got to be part of our essence part of what it is essentially to be human is to be a thinking thing otherwise it wouldn't be nearly so obvious or so close or so direct for us to experience uh, but this isn't the only thing about us Descartes says you know we've got these direct experiences that seem to give evidence that we're thinking things but we've got pretty clear ideas about some other stuff too we've got these experiences of having a body you know we experience things like moving around a room you know I can't walk through walls you know we can do different positions we can stretch we can move we can run we can you know, jump we can do all these other things that require physical substance you know movement and location in space and so it seems like we've got pretty clear ideas about having a body now this body seems to be unthinking you know my hand say if I'm looking at it and moving it around and stuff it doesn't seem to be having any thoughts of its own you know we talk about that that way sometimes metaphorically in English we don't really mean that you know something is a life of its own with regards to my body parts instead all the thinking and perceiving and all that stuff seems to happen in my mind it seems to happen in me so the body seems like it's unthinking but it can perceive you know, it can feel pain, it can see things, it can feel cold, it can touch stuff. You know, so the body can react and soak up things. It can do all the passive processes, but the active stuff like thinking and deciding and choosing, these are things only done by thinking substance. So it seems like we're thinking things, but we're attached to bodies. And the only way that we can perceive and whatnot is that we're attached. So it seems like we've got pretty good reason to think that we're both thinking and physical. So, this starts pointing us towards a little bit of dualism, but you know he wants to clarify a few points as well. See, Descartes wants to point out that while we have bodies, we're not identical to our bodies. In other words, us and our bodies are separate things. And so Descartes gives another argument. Consider like when you wake up in the morning. If you were identical to your body, that is, if you were not separate from your body in some way, if you were literally the exact same thing as your body, then you wouldn't be able to be certain that you existed until you could see the body, or otherwise get physical information about it. You see, the only way that you know about physical stuff is by interacting with it physically. You know, light waves bounce off of something and they reach your eyes, or you touch it, or you smell it, or you hear it. But in order to get information about the physical world, you have to physically interact with it. So in the mornings, before you interact with anything, if you were just your body, you wouldn't have any evidence that you were still there. But you do. You know, that seems like a really dumb question. You wake up in the morning, you know, you're pretty certain that you have continued to exist. And that's because, Descartes says, you just know that directly. That's why that's such an obvious thing and why it feels so strange to question it. So, since we know it so directly, and we only know mental things directly, then our existence seems to be a mental fact. It's something that is tied to our mental selves, not our physical selves. So, you have a body, but you're separate from the body. You are actually located more in the mental part than in the physical. You're made of both, but really you're closer to being just a mind. Furthermore, your body has parts and can be divided into things like feet and arms and eyes and all the rest of it. 
but your mind doesn't. You know, it doesn't make any sense, according to Descartes, to say that feeling or thinking or believing are different parts of the mind, because it's the same mind doing all of these things. But when you're running or jumping or, say, picking something up, then part of your body does it and part of it doesn't. So you can divide up your body in a way you can't divide up your mind. So it seems like they you know, have different properties a little bit. You know, one you can divide up and one you can't. And Descartes meant to be giving all these arguments just as evidence that you have both a mind and a body, but you're not identical with your body. You're not just a physical thing. And so you have a body, it interacts with your mind, but the two aren't the same. Instead, you're probably more closely identified with the mind, but overall, your mind has to have a body, so you're both. Now, according to Descartes, these two things, the mind and the body, they interact at the pineal gland, because it's roughly in the middle of the brain, it's not duplicated, and at the time, in Renaissance Europe, they had no idea what the pineal gland actually did. So Descartes ends up arguing that the seat of interaction between mind and body is there in the middle of your brain. Now we know that it's part of a different system that it helps control hormones and other things in the body. So we know that there's no actual super deep thinking going on in the, pine in the pineal gland. But regardless, it seems like it does happen somewhere in the brain. And that's really the important part to take away from that. And in essence, that's Descartes' argument. It's short, but it's got some pretty you know, deep and substantial ideas to it. Essentially, Descartes arguing that you're an immaterial thinking thing, and you drive around and are intimately connected with a body, a physical thing, and you're closely connected with it, but you're still somewhat distinct from it. And overall, this is a position that probably doesn't seem all that strange to you. You know, perhaps the terminology and the implications of it may be new to you. But chances are most of you people listening, most of you in the class, actually believe some version of this or another. Now, you might use terms like soul instead of a mind or a thinking thing or a thinking substance. The general concept's the same. You're made of two entirely different kinds of thing, a physical part and a non-physical part, that are connected but very distinct from each other. And so in that way, most of you probably are some version of a substance dualist. Now, Descartes' arguments rely on appeals to intuitions and experiences, and probably your own beliefs do as well. You've probably never thought about it. Examining that sort of thing would be good for you. You know, hint, hint. But, you know, chances are you'd, you'd probably use similar reasons to what Descartes does. Now, something to keep in mind as we move forward is different ways to evaluate the argument. Because in doing philosophy, after understanding the argument, evaluating it, seeing whether or not it's right, whether this is a correct or an accurate explanation of what a human being is, is really the next step here. But rather than you know just looking at everything, like how the premises and the conclusion of the argument fit together, I want you to look at a different kind of thing. And this is how your journal topics are going to focus a little bit. Instead of just seeing whether or not this is a valid argument, whether the conclusions and the premises, premises uh, hook up in a certain way, instead I want you to keep in mind that these are attempts at explaining a situation, trying to explain something that science can't solve. So Descartes views an attempted explanation of what kinds of things we are and why we experience things the way we do. So I want you to start considering a new aspect of philosophical thinking a new sort of way of evaluating an argument, particularly evaluating explanations. I want you to try and think about, are there any parts of this explanation that are problematic? Are there any things that aren't really fully explained? Is there anything kind of left out? Is there anything that the explanation doesn't actually explain? Anything it can't account for? Are there any parts of the explanation that just seem totally wild and unbelievable? that are unlikely, implausible. And what sort of things should an explanation of this stuff have? These are the kinds of questions that I want you to focus on as you think about and evaluate Descartes' substance dualism as we move forward. I want you to think about it in terms of an explanation and see if there's any requirements for a good explanation that are being left out here.
Again, this isn't an assignment in and of itself. It's just something that I want you to keep in mind as you do your assignments and as we move forward. Again, your journal topic this week should help you sort some of this stuff out. So, as always, shoot me any questions you've got. Let me know if something's still kind of confusing for you or, you know, a little uncertain. If so, the next reading should help somewhat since it contains an overview of dualism again, but I'll be more than happy to help out with anything that I possibly can. Happy thinking, guys.